Tim Carney was a cab driver, a fairly average one, but a nice guy nonetheless. His average driving day took more than an average turn, however, when Shield Maiden suddenly threw herself into his cab. Follow those police cars, she shouted, slapping the back of his seat twice. He gawked at her. A trim, man-shouldered woman in a purple leotard, mask, and boots sat in his back seat. What the? he exclaimed. Come on, she said again. I can't fly. Let's go. She pointed as another trio of cop cars screamed past them and around the corner. Oh, boy. He threw it into gear and stepped on it. Hope insurance covers this. He nearly nailed a bike messenger, scratched a mailbox, tore around a corner, and gunned his engine. He wagered a glance in the rearview mirror at the tense, glistening woman in his back seat. She was looking out the windshield eagerly, poised to leap out as soon as he stopped. It's the bank on first and third, she murmured mostly to herself, wiping her brow and scrubbing her hair out of her face. She picked at her shield that had stopped more than a few bullets tonight. She'd followed a suspicious-looking character or two down some dark alleys and overheard just the right info, but she'd been spotted. Something big was about to happen, and she'd stumbled across a gathering point. Not drugs this time, but henchmen. Lots and lots of them, waiting to converge on a single location. Waiting vans that were going to go all over the city to confuse the police were poised and ready, but she'd taken them out easily enough. Now the main event was coming. Tim the cabbie slammed on the brakes and Shield Maiden threw the door open. Thanks! she shouted over her shoulder. Wait, your fee! he cried, pointing at the meter. Ah, oh, I'm gonna eat that, aren't I? No one would ever believe a superhero had bummed a ride off him to stop a bank robbery, especially not his hard ass of a boss. He banged the steering wheel and quickly sped away before things got too dangerous at the bank. Shield Maiden ran onto the scene. The police had set up a barricade and had plenty of firepower pointing at the front door and surrounding glass walls. Cars were turned sideways and there were several spotlights searching the side of the building. Shadows moved beyond the windows, but it was hard to see who was who. Without knowing what else to do, Shield Maiden scaled a car and leapt over the barrier to someone with a walkie-talkie. What's happening so far? She tried to sound confident and demanding. Who the heck are you supposed to be? The silver-mustached officer demanded, taking in her outrageous outfit. Get back with the others! As if on cue, the long barrel of a rifle pointed out of a high window. Shield Maiden's eyes caught the tiny glint of metal and she whirled about, lifting her shield high. The bullet blasted off the golden surface of her shield, screaming like a struck bell. She knocked the older officer to the ground as a spray of bullets rained all around her, kneeling into a defensive position. She grit her teeth until the police pulled themselves together. The spotlights converged on the shooter and they returned fire, making the gunman retreat. Shield Maiden, a much younger police officer said, pointing. Shield what? The older officer scrambled for safety out of the firing zone. When they were safely behind an armored van, the younger officer spoke again. It's Shield Maiden. She took out Lord Dragon only a few weeks ago. It was in the papers, he said, adjusting his hat. What's happened so far? Shield Maiden asked again. Goons and gunmen, some pretty heavy firepower, another officer said. Too many hostages to sweep the place with SWAT. They're holding almost everybody in the vault, but you'd need to close it to ensure everyone's safety, and we can't do that remotely. Who are they? Shield Maiden was scanning the building in case another gunman appeared. They call themselves the Thousand Hands. The younger officer opened the armored van and invited her in. Inside was filled with screens and streams of data. The woman behind all the computers gaped at her but quickly remembered herself and coughed. Supposedly, it's a gang with 500 members and a waiting list in case any of them ever dies. How many are there? Not 500, but not a few either. The man shook his head. So here's the vault, and here's the front. He pointed to several places on a waiting map of the building. If we could get the vault closed, the hostages would be safe and we could sweep the building. The only problem is getting there. I'll get there. Shield Maiden nodded seriously. Won't they see you coming? 
Yeah, but they won't be able to stop me, and when their guns don't work, they'll fall to pieces. Shield Maiden said, running a quick hand through her hair and stepping down and out of the armored van. Nice, mumbled the woman behind the computers, watching her go. At least take this. He gave her an earpiece. Shield Maiden nodded and took it, tapping her ear twice. I'll be in touch, she smiled. Gathering civilians pointed and took pictures with their phones while police tried to usher them back out of firing range. A young black woman with mannish shoulders and a shield on her arm strode towards the bank steps. The asphalt, sidewalk, nearby cars, and more were riddled with bullet holes. They must have carted in a lot of ammo doing this. A quick tinkling of glass around her feet made Shield Maiden look up just in time. Minigun! Someone roared, and everybody threw themselves behind cover. Bullets rained from the sky as another gunman appeared, toting a massive spinning machine gun in his hip. Police cars exploded into flames, flying over themselves and landing upside down. The armored van shook and rattled until both of its left side tires exploded. Bits of stone and asphalt flew and rained in all directions as the stream of bullets sprayed in a wide arc. Civilians ran and screamed in terror. Shield Maiden lifted her shield high as the bullets rained all around her. She gritted her teeth and shouted in effort as they spattered and ricocheted and dug at her shield. It would not bend. It would not break. But that was not the case for her arm. Falling to one knee, she pressed her palm against the hot backing of the shield to hold it steady. She's drawing attention! Return fire! Twenty or thirty police officers popped bravely up from behind their barriers and vehicles, shooting wildly up at the man with the minigun. He quickly retreated, but Shield Maiden did see a spray of sparks from his chest. So, he was wearing armor then. The superhero stood slowly, a little shaky from being the center of attention. Limbering up her left hand and shoulder, she switched arms with her shield, looking around her feet. The street was more open holes than flat ground. Squaring her shoulders, she crossed the sidewalk, mounted the stairs, and went inside. The lobby was cavernous and dead quiet. They already know I'm here. I should be quick, she coached herself. Be careful, said her earpiece. The vault in question was downstairs, but many of the gunmen were upstairs to keep a view on the police, including the minigun and armor man. Dashing to the right set of stairs, she rounded the corner to find two or three gunmen not paying attention. She slide-tackled the first, sending him ass over tea kettle into a stone column. Spinning about like an ice skater, she slammed the face of her shield into the second, sending him careening into some furniture. The third turned and squeezed the trigger of his rifle, spraying bullets over her shoulder as she closed the distance. Taking a page out of Lord Dragon's book, she seized him by the neck and slammed him squarely onto his back against the marble floor. Kicking his gun away, she hammered his face twice with the narrow of her shield before he was unconscious. Panting, she stood. It was a teller's great room, plenty of desks and stamps to stamp things with. Heavy, thick wooden doors in every direction. All right, head left and further down. The vault is below everything for safekeeping. Shield Maiden pulled the door but threw herself into a roll and defend stance as bullets came hailstorming down the hallway. A group of four or five gunmen awaited her, unloading their guns wildly back and forth. She scrambled forward and behind a column until the firestorm stopped. She stuck out her shield. More bullets came. She did so again. More bullets. I don't suppose you can set off the sprinkler system, she whispered to her earpiece. One minute, she heard. There was some urgent mumbling on the line. Any second now... There! Suddenly the whole hallway burst into rain and startled the waiting gunman, who turned this way and that in confusion. The few precious seconds was all she needed. Shield Maiden clotheslined the first man, using the momentum to throw him into the rest. The tangle of arms and legs sent weapons flying, and she leapt into the fray. Wild punching, kicking, shouting, shield slamming filled the hallway before Shield Maiden stood over them all, soaked and panting. Pushing her bangs out of her eyes, she continued forward, splashing down the passage and to more stairs. She kicked a door in, only to find a single man guarding the vault itself. 
He whirled towards her, but she could see the end of his gun shaking. Think about how many people I got past to get here to you, she said, rolling her shoulders a little. You can surrender, or... He sprayed her with bullets, and her shield absorbed all the punishment. His clip ran dry pretty quickly. He stood there, wide-eyed in his ski mask, shaking like a leaf. I offered, she said, drawing close and giving him a half-hearted punch in the face. He hit the wall, sprawled, and then didn't move. A large group of bank tellers, janitors, and a few others were in the vault when Shield Maiden got close enough to see. They stared at her in shock. Who is that? one of them said. I'm Shield Maiden. I came to rescue you, she said, checking the hallway behind her in case more gunmen from the Thousand Hands came. Are all the bank employees here? Yes, it's late, so almost everyone else had already gone home, an old woman said. Are you going to lead us out of here? No, it's too dangerous, Shield Maiden said, shaking her head. We have to lock you in the vault where it's safe until police and SWAT can clear the building of all the gunmen. Won't we suffocate? One of the janitors wondered wildly. Oh no, it's an air vent for just such a lock-in incident, the elderly bank teller said, pointing. Everybody craned their necks. A tiny vent the size of a bread box was in the corner of the ceiling. The police will come get you when it's safe, I promise. Shield Maiden took the massive door in both hands. Stay here. She offered up her best superhero smile and pushed the massive vault closed. Reaching, she tossed the barred dial to spin it securely into place. She touched the earpiece. The hostages are safe. Send everyone in. Roger that, Shield Maiden. Come on out. We'll take it from here. Will do. She smiled and puffed up her chest, feeling like a job well done. Even from where she stood, she could hear windows breaking and lots of boots stamping up and down the stairways. The purple-clad hero made her way up and out to the ground floor. She paused in the entryway, watching various groups of SWAT move through the rooms. A lot of guns got pointed her way, but when they realized who she was, they let her pass without a second glance. Shield Maiden. Her earpiece crackled to life again. Yes? The man with the minigun is still in the building, he said gravely. Shield Maiden paused, looking at the quartet of elevator doors to one side of her. SWAT was taking the stairs. She bit her lip. Should she press her luck? A muffled hailstorm of gunfire somewhere high above her was her answer. If whoever that was had bulletproof armor, those SWAT teams wouldn't stand a chance. Squaring her shoulders, she gave a resolute sort of huff. I'm on it. She turned and touched the elevator button. Bing! The sudden screaming barrage of bullets rained bullet shells all around her feet. Shield Maiden thrust up her shield as the spinning barrel of a minigun sprouted out of the opening elevator doors. He was right there! Point blank, hundreds of rounds smattered against her unyielding defense. The man shouted a long, exhilarated scream of battle to her face, the kind you only get from firing a gun bigger than you are. Hot lead and casings flew in all directions. She was less than three feet away from the spray of the gun. She dug in her heels but felt herself being bodily pushed back by the force of the assault. Her boots squeaked on the smooth marble. The flashes of light and hot metal lit the hallway and sent SWAT members rushing around the corner with their guns trained. The metal armored man flung himself back into the elevator and jabbed the button with his thumb. Shield Maiden threw herself in after him, hoping to jam the doors and make them reopen. To her surprise, he embraced her and yanked her inside. The doors closed. She headbutted him and they parted. He lifted his minigun in the tiny space and she seized the spinning mechanism, pushing it to one side so it sprayed dozens of holes in the wall behind her. The elevator began to climb. He pulled a sidearm from his belt and she slapped it aside with her shield. She hammered his head with the flat of her weapon, sending him clanking against the wall. The minigun sprayed and she grabbed it by the base. Together they drew a long and powerful line from the floor, up the wall, across the ceiling, and down the other wall. The elevator car moaned and jostled in warning. Had they hit the cables? Both of them froze. Both of them looked. 
The floor indicator said seven. Flying downward seven floors to a crashing death would kill them both, surely. They panted, glistening with sweat as the elevator kept climbing. So, who are you supposed to be? She wanted to know. Ten Ton Gun Shogun. His accent was thick and Asian. Leader of the Thousand Hands. Shield Maiden stared at him. His armor wasn't just shiny, it was vaguely Japanese, like a shogun samurai, but trimmed down and modernized for far better movement. She wondered what it was made of. It repelled bullets almost as well as her shield, but she could see the bumps, dents, and imperfections. Impressive, no, woman? He caught her looking. I... I don't know if I should be offended for me or for you, she said, a little dumbfounded at him. I saw you in the paper, shield maiden, he said, eyeing the climbing number on the wall next to them. The battle would resume as soon as the doors opened. They both held the minigun with both hands, vying for leverage. Neither would give the other a good handhold. I'm flattered. Not every girl makes a supervillain's nightstand. Know thy enemy, he tut-tutted her. Did you know I'd be coming to stop you? Better you than Laser Wolf or Gel Girl or some such. You're not in the big leagues like they are. His eyes narrowed in amusement. She wanted to punch his metal face mass so, so badly. It won't take someone that powerful to knock you down, you... Bing! Both of them gave a start and they threw themselves out of the elevator into another great room. Endless rows of desks and a few columns greeted them. He wrenched away from her, lifting the minigun, and it started spinning. Refusing to step far enough away to let him use his main weapon, Shield Maiden closed the distance so that the long barrels of the gun were behind her. He pulled a short pistol, firing wildly while the minigun sprayed behind her. Hundreds of windows exploded violently, holes working their way up the walls and columns. Shield Maiden slapped the gun aside, and the bullet whizzed past her head. He aimed and she ducked. He aimed and she spun about to clang her shield against his face. He aimed and she shrieked as a bullet pierced her shoulder and out the other side. Not a complete penetration of the muscle, but it had been the top of her shoulder. The clip emptied and fell smoking from the gun. She staggered back when the minigun stopped, smoldering with the heat of the constant fire. He pistol whipped her and she fell backward over a desk with a cry, holding her face. She seized a box of papers and threw them one way, leaping out from behind the desk the other way. Ten-ton gun Shogun chose wrong and sprayed the flying box with bullets while Shield Maiden recovered. Jumping to her feet, she stepped over the desk and leapt high. He wasn't quick enough to raise the minigun, and she slammed his face so hard that his mask flew off. He staggered with a spit of blood, and she rolled away from the spin of bullets. Was he wearing a backpack of ammo or something? While he scrambled for his mask, Shield Maiden saw his back. Sure enough, he had a padded ammo box of some description strapped to his back. It was feeding the minigun a constant stream of bullets. She charged and jumped onto him before he could turn around to shoot some more. He gave a staggering shout, driven to the floor. She punched the back of his head three, four, five times. It was then that the elevator car decided to snap. It rolled all the way down the shaft and crashed to the ground floor. Shield Maiden made the mistake of looking up to check the noise. Ten-ton gun Shogun flailed and then jammed a thumb onto a little panel on his gauntlet. Suddenly, his backpack sprouted glider wings and ignited with two tiny engines. He rocked it away, belly first, across the room. Shield Maiden was thrown from his back in a blast of heat and light. The silver-armored villain went out the window with a smash of glass and was blocks away before she even got to her feet. Shield Maiden rushed to the edge, shouting a swear word and grasping at her bleeding shoulder. Did he get away? The earpiece wanted to know. Shield Maiden sagged against the window frame, sighing. Yeah, she finally admitted. Some kind of jetpack. He called himself Ten Ton Gun Shogun. That's stupid. That's a stupid name. 
the earpiece said flatly. I know, right? Shield Maiden demanded. She turned when Swat suddenly arrived in the room. He's gone, she shouted to them. They cleared the room and she sighed again, heading for the stairs. You saved a lot of lives today, Shield Maiden, the earpiece said quietly. Thank you. Yeah, she looked longingly out the window and into the cityscape beyond. He'd gotten away. Yeah, she said again, heading down. Her benefactor would not be happy about this, much less with her getting shot. She was better than that. Shield Maiden rolled her eyes at the lecture she knew she was going to get. A few days later, Wanda sat sulking in her antiques and curiosities shop. He'd gotten away. Damn it. Even selling the raven skeleton to an enthusiastic collector for three hundred bucks hadn't cheered her up. She touched her forehead where she'd been pistol whipped. Her benefactor had taken care of her shoulder, but insisted that she keep that injury as a punishment for her carelessness. Bitch. Wanda! Darren rang the bell when he pushed open the door. I brought smoothies! He sing-songed. He froze in the doorway. Oh my god, what happened to you? He charged the front counter to hold her face with both hands, practically throwing the drinks down. Did you get mugged? Sorry, not that interesting. She gestured to a shallow cardboard box that she'd prepared for the lie she was about to tell. A shattered ammonite fossil the size of a dinner plate was inside. He frowned at it curiously and then looked at her. That's what I get for keeping that on the high shelf. The lady that wanted it had a heart attack when I fell off my stepladder and it hit me in the face. She pointed at the bruise on her forehead. Oh, baby, he said sympathetically, leaning and tenderly kissing it. It pulsed in pain, but she smiled at him gratefully. She took the smoothie with her name on it and pressed it to her forehead instead of drinking it. Yeah, there you go, see? I help sometimes. Darren stroked his goatee twice with a grin. Yeah, you really do, she giggled at him. They made small talk for a bit. Truth be told, the shop was doing pretty well lately, with all the damage from the fight between Dr. Galaxy, Laser Wolf, and Gel Girl, many people in the city were getting new dwellings after their old ones were destroyed. That meant decorating, and that meant visiting curiosity stores like hers for interesting items. Wanda had raked in more than she'd spent at the police auction in less than a week. How'd the photo shoot go? Eh, they wanted me to model in some Christmas underwear that had mistletoe hanging off the crotch he said. She snorted, grinning at the image in her mind. I told him no, so we went straight to the summer trunk shoot, and my agent is setting up something for later this week, something suntan lotion related. Huh. Well, I drove past your chapstick billboard a few days ago. Wanda tap-tapped her phone a few times and turned it around to show him the picture. She'd taken a selfie in front of the billboard, dazzling smile and pointing up at it. He grinned appreciatively. Mom says to tell you congratulations. I love your mom. She's too nice to me. Darren chuckled, leaning on the counter. They leaned to kiss, but a sudden gaggle of children came in with trading cards to buy and sell. Darren politely waited in the aisles for her to conduct business, pricing things and selling things as she went. It amazed Darren sometimes how many facts and figures Wanda could scramble around in her brain all at once, and it was a little intimidating sometimes. Oh well, he was just a pretty face in her life, he guessed. The thought made him laugh and he pawed through some of the dusty books on a kiosk. When the last kid was gone, Wanda found him in the aisle. Where were we? She waggled her eyebrows at him. Oh, Miss Summers, no, not my virtue. Darren laughed when she palmed his chest to push him against a display case. He put his forearm over his forehead dramatically. Yes, yes, your virtue. She laughed aloud, kissing his neck and working her way up to his lips. Her phone went off. Ugh. She grumped, sagging. Darren grinned at her, frozen in place like someone had paused a movie. She swatted him and he laughed, going to sit on a bar stool that sat in a corner. He knew business was important. Wanda Summers, Collectibles, Antiques, and Curiosities, she answered. 
Wanda. It was Aiko's voice. I need your help with something. That made Wanda pause and frown. Aiko never directly asked for help with, well, anything. Darren saw her smile fall, and he mouthed a question. She mouthed Aiko's name at him. Come home after your shop is closed. I need you for something important. What is it? Wanda wanted to know. It's private, Aiko said carefully. Her usual flat tone actually faltered for a moment. We'll talk in person. She hung up after that. Huh, Wanda said, looking at the phone. She saved the number to read home from then on so she'd know the number when it popped up again. What was that about? Not sure. Maybe she needs dating advice. Got a man in her life, finally? Darren said innocently. She swatted him on the shoulder as she walked by, fishing behind the counter for her phone's charger cable. You know she's probably gay, right? She is. Darren pondered. She watched the expression on his face wander from confusion to thoughtfulness, and then over to a boyish smile. Then he looked at her acidic frown. What? he said defensively. Quit it, she told him, pointing at his nose. He put both hands up. I won't say anything to her. There was a long silence, and Wanda waited for him to add. So does she bring girls home all the time, or quit it? Wanda insisted. Wanda arrived home later that night after closing time, tossing her purse onto her bed and getting into some sweatpants. She found Aiko and Jasmine in the living room, and Aiko shut her laptop with a snap as soon as she came through the archway. Welcome home, she said blandly. I need a favor. I'll pay you. Oh my god, did you get mugged? Jasmine demanded, pointing at her face. Wanda cringed a little when the bouncing blonde rushed up to grab the sides of her head. You look terrible. I'll get you some ice. I don't need ice. I'm fine. It doesn't even hurt that much. Wanda smiled despite herself. Something fell off a high shelf, and I got a little bump. I've had this mark for two or three days, Jasmine. Did you just now notice it? Jasmine actually blushed, coughing twice and letting her go. Much like a new haircut, you only got one chance to notice a friend with a huge bruise on their forehead. Ahem, Aiko reminded. You do know we're friends, right? Wanda said. You don't have to pay me. You can pay me. Jasmine raised a hand with a lopsided grin, earning a dark look from Aiko. What? Not everyone in this room is rich or owns a business. Both women rolled their eyes. Wanda sat on the couch to hear what was going on. I have to attend a... gathering, Aiko said slowly, and I need some friends to go with me to keep me from getting hit on. Well, that's not a big deal. We did it all the time in college, Wanda said with a smile. This gathering is a charity ball, and includes some of the richest people in the city. Aiko said less gently, reaching and passing them both a brochure. These are the kind of people that decide what gets built and where in the city. She opened her laptop again and turned it around for them to see. On it was a splash page of recognizable company logos. Business moguls, church officials, high-end investors like myself, and more. Some of them are not good people. You want us there to play defense so no weird rich guys try to make a pass at you? Jasmine wondered, leaning and touching the screen. It was the CEO of a chain of gas stations, over 50 locations along the coast. That's the idea, Aiko said with a nod. Makes me feel safer. You said this was a charity event. What charity is it? Children's Hospital. The combined financial power of all these people is paying millions of dollars of unaffordable bills here in the United States and parts of Mexico, Aiko said clinically. Aw, oh, that's sweet, Jasmine said. So if little Timmy falls down a well and breaks his arm, you guys are paying for the cast? More like if little Timmy's home and family are incinerated because of a supers battle, he can at least get counseling and a new place to live, Aiko said. Wanda shuddered. It's for more extreme cases that have no hope of paying for a new lease on life. 
so they don't disappear into the foster care system without any hope of a normal life. Well then, Jasmine said a little uncomfortably, that's very noble of you, Wanda said carefully. So all the people that are donating have to show up to this party? The approval of your peers can be a strong driving force, Aiko said slowly, turning her laptop back around. They'll be casting their nets to make business deals, shake hands, and talk about how great they are for donating seven figures to the children. That sort of thing. How much did you... That's not up for discussion. Aiko shook her head quickly. I'll give both of you a thousand dollars to pose as my assistant and my bodyguard. A thousand dollars, Jasmine said, eyes widening. Bodyguard? Wanda wondered aloud. Are you expecting to get attacked? No, but it'd give you a nice excuse to swat any unwelcome hands. Aiko said, I'm young, rich, and not politically affiliated with any of these people. I donated to donate, not to spread newspaper ink about my reputation. I'll do it, Jasmine said, leaning forward with a grin. All right, Wanda smiled slowly. You don't want me to dress in a zoot suit or anything, do you? Just a regular suit would do. Aiko seemed to relax, leaning back in her recliner at last. She looked more than a little relieved. I'll pay for that as well. In the meantime, why don't I take you girls out tonight? Yeah, Jasmine said, pumping a fist into the air. That night, Aiko took them to a nice steak place, just the three of them, to talk and eat and catch up on their day-to-day -day lives. Wanda told them about how well the store was doing. Most of what she'd gotten at the police auction had already been sold. She'd met a trading card collector for a very nice full binder sale, and the upkeep repairs to her van had cost way less than she'd been afraid of. Jasmine reported about the uppity actresses at her work, how many stacks of paperwork she had to go through for just one day of filming, and the daily drama of the industry. Wanda had met Darren through Jasmine, so there was no limit to the number of secret side stories she brought home from work sometimes. What about you, Aiko? Wanda wanted to know. How goes trading? Aiko shrugged a little, staring into her drink. Her thoughts were clearly elsewhere. Money is money, she said. It doesn't change or move. It just has to be reorganized every few days. It was no secret Aiko had been a major company owner once upon a time, but she'd shunned the responsibility, sold the company to a worthy buyer, and had made out like a bandit. Since then, she'd merely done some wise reinvestment and had been living an easy life, much to her father's hatred. But daddy issues were a talk for another day. Remember that gaming company that got into trouble in Belgium for loot boxes and aiming gambling towards kids? Yeah? They lost almost 400 employees in the past couple of weeks. Looks like they're on their way out for their dirty practices. Good thing I sold all of my stock before the whole thing crashed and burned. Echo's Cheshire cat smile seemed to slowly lift with her spirits. She sipped her soda. Wanda wondered, not for the first time, just how much capital Echo could sling around at a moment's notice. But she was too close of a friend to ever talk about the subject. The conversation meandered for a bit while they whined, dined, and got a cab home. Aiko rested her head against the window, not something Wanda had ever seen her do. There was probably more to this than she was telling them, but if she needed support, she would get it. The night of the charity event, the three of them arrived by Wanda's van. Aiko stepped into her heels before stepping out into the dusty alley Wanda had chosen. A glittering midnight dress clung to her body, but didn't show off any skin, tying tightly up and around her neck. Jasmine wore a cheap gray business suit, the only thing she could find on such short notice, and Wanda had rented a man's suit to accommodate her wide shoulders. They stopped to check each other over and then rounded the corner to go up the sidewalk and into the event center.